Somebody, uh, Mary is on the computer and, and uh, she'll uh, let me know or let the speaker know if you have a question or anything coming in through the chat. Um, if you are here and are an existing and returning volunteer, then we really don't have any paperwork to do today. That's a good thing. If you're here and you're new and you'd like to sign up as a volunteer, uh, after the, the meeting and when we're um, kind of breaking up, talk to Matt and he'll make sure that you uh, get signed up. Okay. Um, you can also go to the Friends of Sleeping Bear Dunes, uh, Friends of Sleeping Bear dot org, and, or just Google Friends of Sleeping Bear Dunes. And uh, on the website, there's a place called Volunteer, drop down menu, Volunteer Registration. And that's how you can get in. So for existing volunteers, I guess you do have one, one duty that you have to do. Uh, when you go home, go to the website and put in your hours for being here today. Okay, because training is, is part of your volunteer commitment. So um, do that when you get home and uh, give yourself at least a couple hours because uh, we're, we're locking the doors. You can't get out until three o'clock. <laughs> so there. And I have I have law enforcement here manning the door. You cannot leave until they let you out. Three o'clock. Yeah. Um, so most of the time when you do a volunteer program with us, you are on your own schedule. You're doing adopt the beach or adopt the trail. Um, maybe you're a Heritage Trail ambassador. You jump on the bike, you ride your trail, and then when you get home, you you register that you've done this work and the number of hours that uh, you, you put in. So normally you don't see all the other volunteers who are doing all the other things that uh, besides what you're doing. Or even you might see a adoptive beach volunteer if you're out doing your beach and somebody else is out doing the beach. Or Heritage Trail Ambassador, you might see them. But uh, this is a, an opportunity for you to see a whole bunch of people doing a whole bunch of different things. All right, so it's kind of cool. So um, today's uh, agenda is I'm going to talk a little bit about the friends and uh, just kind of a recap. Matt Mormon, who's doing it on the computer, but you don't have to come up yet. Okay, I'm not ready for you yet. Uh, he's going to give you kind of a, a welcome and a thank you and so forth from Pat, uh, the park staff. And uh, and then we have Mike and Paul, are going to, our law enforcement rangers, are going to talk about um, how you interact with our visitors, um, especially those who are not following the rules. And, um, and they'll be here to answer any of your questions relative to interaction with park visitors or safety also. Um, so Friends of Sleep Bear Dunes is an all volunteer 
nonprofit that supports the park. Our mission is really protecting resources, both natural resources, cultural and historical resources, recreational resources, any resources of the park, and heightening uh, visitor experience. So a lot of the things that we do are educational or like what we're doing with Peace Art. We heighten the, the experience of the visitor by not letting them get into a trouble, right? There's nothing worse than having your vacation end in the hospital. And so, you know, talking to people before they get into trouble is kind of what we're after on, um, on the Peace Art program. And uh, a lot of educational programs that we do as well. And I'm going to just mention a few of these because um, I think we normally we think about friends of Sleeping Bear Dunes. We think about adopt the beach and adopt the trail, adopt the river, and and that sort of thing. Um, but there's a lot of other stuff that we do that um, that you may not be aware of. So I mentioned the Peace Art program. Um, Jesse will be up here in a little bit to talk a little bit more about that. Um, but that's where we have um, volunteers out at the number nine overlook and the Simi Drive and at the Dune Climb, talking to people, you know, reminding them to take water, sunscreen. It's very difficult, some of these hikes are, and uh, trying to make sure that people are uh, engaged in, and uh, doing things safely. We also have a track chair program, and the track chair program is for people who want to be out taking a hike. Um, going out to the beach, but they don't have the physical capability of doing it. Maybe they're wheelchair bound, maybe they're using a walker, maybe they used to be active and loved hiking, but now they can't because they, maybe they got a broken leg. Now we've had kids doing the track chair that have had a, like a broken leg or, or whatever. So um, that track chair program, we run that program from the Keller House Farm in Fort Oneida around the Bayview, Bayview Trail, the farm loop. And we also do, uh, do it from the Platte River Campground on the railroad grade trail out to the beach. So we have two, two sites, three chairs. Um, and we have volunteers that go with the people, right? So you're, you're there to help out. You're there to answer questions and make sure that they don't get into any trouble. Like you wouldn't really want to drive the track chair into Lake Michigan. <laughs> that would be a problem. So, um, or off the cliff, right? That's not, not good either. So, um, we also funded last year and are funding again this year uh, several Anishinaabe uh, programs within the park, educational program about first uh, the first world tribes. And so, uh, that's something that we fund through the and implement through Parks Interpretive Division. Um, so uh, star star parties star parties are back again this year, so we're um, supporting the star parties as well. There's a mobile visitor center van that goes out through the park and but also out to other festivals and so forth, and we support support that. Um, yeah. So how many volunteers do you think we have at, with friends of Sleeping Bear Dunes? Okay, because there are other volunteers that volunteer directly with the park, but just friends of Sleeping Bear Dunes. How many? Okay. <laughs> You're reading ahead. <laughs> um, we picked up uh, over a thousand pounds of litter, and actually we just today, Matt and I, Picked up probably another 250 yeah. pounds this morning. <laughs> so our numbers are going to be higher now. We got to make sure they get to the Yeah. Um, and also, we have a there's a bark ranger program. If you have pets and want to help us with uh, educating people that are out on the, the, the beaches where the piping plover are nesting, we want to inform people that this is an area that we uh, exclude pets. So that's a, the Bark Ranger program. So uh, last year we had over 12,000 hours of uh, reported volunteer effort. And um, so that's like six full-time employees. That's pretty cool. 
and, and, uh, and I know, you know, when you get back to your home and you're tired after walking the beach or your trail or whatever, last thing you want to do is sit down at the computer and report in. But it really does help us. And it helps Matt in his budget uh, for hiring more interns and getting more, more of a budget for programs that uh, include volunteers. So um, with that background of Friends of Sigmergen, um, oh, I'll also tell you that uh, last year, the last fiscal year, we support the park with um, donations or things that we would buy and then donate to the park to the tune of $177,000. Okay, and now, and most of that comes from donations from individuals. 60% of our funding comes from individuals like you. Okay, and so 177,000 last year, we're building a big uh, storage garage up at the Dune Climb. That's an addition to the Dune Center store. Stop by and check it out sometime. It's not done, but it'll be done hopefully by uh, early June. And um, we'll let you all know about that. We'll have a party. So, uh, so that's going to be almost $200,000 to build that garage. And then that's going to be donated to the park as soon as it's done. Um, so anyway, that it gives you an idea of what the Friends of Sigmar Dunes is. And uh, with that, I'll have Matt come up and give you a greeting from the park. <laughs> So you gotta stand right here. You do. can't walk around. No. <laughs> All right. So welcome everybody. Um, and unfortunately, Scott uh, Tucker, the superintendent, um, and Tom Allred, the deputy, are both gone. Uh, so you're stuck with me. Um, so, but I know that they. I talked to them on Thursday before they left. They both wanted to relay their heartfelt thanks for the volunteer effort that all you guys do. I mean, there's hundreds of thousands of hours, hundreds of volunteers, and thousands of dollars in worth of got to be true, right? So that's part of it. Um, so uh, a couple things on the park update that Scott gave me. Can you hear me? Is this low enough? Do I need to readjust it? A little bit louder. Loud, loud, yeah, so I'm not as tall as Gary. Does that go down? There we go. How about now? Is that better? Yeah, okay. Um, so park update, a couple uh, things that Scott wanted me to relay. South Manitou Island, there's a lot going on out there right now with contracting. Uh, the lighthouse is being rehabbed, uh, the keeper's quarters and some of the outbuildings out there. If you haven't been, I highly recommend a trip out to uh, the islands and check them out. So that's a lot going on. Then in the next four years, there's a Great Outdoors Act. You might have heard that, of that. That was signed two years ago. That is a huge pot of money that was dedicated directly to the Park Service. Um, to address backlog maintenance. And so for the first two years, it's two years that it's been in place. The first two years, the huge parks out west have been working on massive projects like a water system redo at Yellowstone for you know something like $35, $40 million. So the, finally, it's like Merdoon's turn <laughs> to get in, to get our hands in this pot a little bit. And so again, we're gonna address the islands uh, with this. And so every, Structure, every infrastructure piece out there is going to be touched by this. And it's for everything from the docks, the roofs, the outhouses, the wells, the water, everything out there is going to be addressed um, and either updated, replaced, whatever it needs, it's going to get um, over the next three years now uh, that project will build. So that's really exciting uh, out there. Staff wise, um, we got 72 seasonals that just showed up within the last probably two to four weeks. 15 more to come for the season. Uh, there's 12 vacancies that we just did not get hired. Um, just like everyone else, we're feeling it um, with the hiring crunch. And um, one, there's a couple of key spots. One of them is our PSAR ranger that coordinates PSAR. So we're going to rely heavily on Jesse this year and the uh, rangers we have in place to run that program because as Gary Detail, it's, it, it, I mean, it's essential. It has reduced our calls out of the dunes by what, nine, almost 90%. Um, oh. Yeah, I mean, we had ridiculous amounts of calls out there rivaling um, Grand Canyon in 911 calls, which is just not right. So with some education and pre-planning, that's been reduced down um, by just a massive amount. Um, the other key uh, spot that we did not get people hired was in fees. 
Um, so our folks that staff the uh, booths at Kirkpatrick and Steve Drive and, Dune, and the Dune Climb, there's eight vacancies there. Um, so the Dune Climb, probably not going to be, that booth will probably not be open this year at all. Um, and then the scenic drive is just going to be hit or miss whether that is open or not. So what does that mean? Um, that means less revenue for the park, first off. Um, and then secondly, the people who want to buy a pass, I mean, who want to do the right thing and buy a pass, it's not convenient. There's only, you know, the visitor center, the campgrounds, and then a few of the third party uh, vendors that sell. So you're going to see people out there saying, how do I buy my pass? And there are self-pay stations um, and this is all on the website. So check that out. Um, we're really trying to help people find the places to get a pass. So there's self-pay stations and then the visitor center campgrounds and then some third party um, vendors out there too. So um, check that out, have that info. Um, I mean, it's a good idea to get on the website and just check out that all of the info on there prior to going out. Cause you're gonna get questions. You'll get stumped. I get stumped every day, uh, almost through the summer. So the more info you have, people are going to ask you stuff. You can just let them know what's going on, like events, star parties, that kind of thing. It's good to be able to just tell people what's going on. There. So uh, the other big thing this summer is cashless um, fees. Fees are going completely cashless, which means you got to have a card or your phone or some other way to pay the dollar bills. And so um, you can use cash at the self-pay. So if somebody were to show up and say, I only have, you know, I got a hundred dollar bill, I don't want to do well, there is self-pay that they can go out and get an envelope with cash in. Um, you can also go down to the gas station and buy a, a um, what do they call it, prepaid credit card or something to come back and then use that at the visitor center. But yeah, we are cashless this summer. So, and that's a park-wide, MPS-wide initiative um, to start going that way. So, um, all right, what else? A couple more things on here. So big projects on the mainland pyramid point trail starting up, I think this week. Um, they're going to enlarge that if you've been out there recently. That is just a kind of free for all parking. So we're going to try and get our arms around that at least a little bit and direct, you know, the, the resource damage by parking on the grass is not going to be parking lot, um, at least some of it. So I don't think you'll be able to address that, all of that, or Empire Club with the uh, amount of people that go there. Eastern National, the um, bookstore that operates in the visitor center, that's a, a third party. Um, Cooperating association. That's not the park service. That's that's an association that works there called East International. They're in many parks throughout the East Coast. They are fully staffed this summer. They did an awesome job. So that means the Dune Climbs bookstore and the um, general store in Glenhaven are both going to be open um, a lot this summer, like almost full time. So that's really great uh, news for us because again, a percentage of what they make in the park comes back to the park. So uh, that's going to be helpful. And then uh, the last thing is the Apple project. I, I threw that on there. Scott didn't tell me about it, but hey, I got a microphone. I'm talking about it. <laughs> That's kind of my uh, pet thing. So we're um, we're calling it the Apple Restoration, Apple Preservation Project. We just named it this summer because it's going to be an official project. Um, so apple trees uh, have a lifespan, of course, and the settlers that brought them here. 100 to 130 years ago and planted them. You've, I'm sure, been out in the park and seen them. They're dying. They're hitting their lifespan and they're dying off. The few that are alive, they have hollow trunks and you're looking like, how can that tree even be alive? But it is. So we're grafting them. To save those varieties, those old antique varieties that just aren't even in existence, some of them, or very rare, uh, we want to save those in the park. They're an asset just like a farm or a, um, you know, the, the cannery. So we want to keep those in the park and growing. So that's going well. Um, we got about... 75 varieties grafted, um, maybe 120 trees in the nursery, our little nursery we have. And then we have uh, 32 in one orchard, 30 in another, and we just moved 20 more out. So these are out in orchards that came out of our nursery to repopulate these orchards at Fort Anaya. So that's a really cool project that um, I'm, I really like the project. So if you want to hear more about it, let me know. Uh, or if you want to volunteer for it, let me know. If you want to water them this summer, let me know. <laughs> Last summer was a dang drought, and that was really hard to keep them alive. So, um, anyway, so again, thank you for all for being here. Um, I know that uh, uh, we're going to get you over to the Rangers quickly so they can get back out. But how many brand new volunteers? I'd like to see hands. How many people have never reported hours as a member of the Friends? Wow. <laughs> 
Okay, a uh, couple of things we, we have to have you do, as I mentioned, it's the government, there's got to be paperwork, right? So, um, there's a volunteer service agreement that we got to have you fill out and sign the back, and there's some check boxes in there, like, you know, are you, do you have medical issues, that kind of thing. Read those, go through that, and sign that, and that does a couple things. That will get you in my database, and I can enter your hours and keep track of those, which Carrie mentioned. The more hours, the hours that we get reported by you guys and all our other volunteers are directly tied to what I get as a budget each year. And that budget, about 75% of it pays for interns, their um, meal stipends and their housing here at the park. And so the interns, the reason that's important is because to get hired by the park service is pretty darn hard. And so it's a foot in the door for those guys. And we have a great record of hiring our former interns or getting them hired somewhere else as staff. I mean, almost all of our interns, if they want to get into this uniform the next season um, here or somewhere else, which is important because, I mean, look at me, I'm, this is the, I'm too old. We need somebody to come in. Right? So we need these kids to come in and, and uh, get in the park service somehow. It's a great program. So your hours are support that program absolutely A to B. Um, and there's not a lot of middle to it, really. So keep those hours coming to me. Um, and then the second thing that form does, while you're actively volunteering, if you were to be injured, um, you are under our, the government's workman's comp. Um, if you're, if you say you're out doing whatever and you get injured, um, let me know, let your supervisor know, uh, who you'll know who that is once you get in your program today, you'll break out and meet them hopefully. Um, if you're injured or even a tick, so I gotta throw ticks out there. You guys have probably thought maybe you will, maybe you won't, but ticks, um, they're big here now, unfortunately. and so. Take all preventative measures that you can, but if you get an embedment, um, you want to report that, or you may not want to. You have to report that <laughs> because we're tracking them. Um, it helps us know where they're being, you know, where people are getting them. And um, also in the future, you if you were to get lines, you would. That's a way to track that. Okay, yep, you got it while you're actively volunteering. I was on the doctor trail. I got home that night. I had a tick. That's a reportable thing. If you're in your yard planting trees and you get a tick, not reportable, right? So mm -hmm. actively volunteering. Um, any questions on the VSA volunteer service agreement? Mm -hmm. Okay, reporting hours, yep, pretty easy. You can either, well, no, you go on the website. There isn't an either or. Um, yep, go on the website and that's it, report hours like that. So good, uh, let me check my list, make sure I got everything. Okay, what, oh, go ahead. Question. Uh, report like a tick, what is what was the reporting hours? Did you want to put it in the comments? Or? Comment, you know, there's two ways. No, more than two ways, but yeah. you. Oh, Can you repeat the question for. Oh, sorry. Yes. Thank you. Yep. So, how to report if you had a tick embedment? What's the question? So, um, there's several ways you can report it. One, I mean, just, just email to your whoever your program lead is. What program are you in, say? Uh, uh, PSAR and uh, uh, family. Yep. So, in PSAR, you know, email Jesse. And tell him, hey, I take a bedman, and then he will get the word to me. And then if you, you know, it's your choice. You do not have to do a workman's comp thing, but I have to do a safety report on it. So we'll need some info on that. And you can also uh, report in the comments section of, the, of your hours report. You can, although I'm I don't get those. But do you get, yeah, you you get those? Do they, for example, I do an extra email. Okay. <laughs> you actually read them. Yeah, no, that's good. Uh, the hours thing is good. A lot of them say the Heritage Trail of Bastards. There's over 100 of you guys. Um, yeah. And so Mary, wherever she is, right, right here. And I do read them all. You read them all, but I maybe do. not like that day or the day after, which is when we want to know. So um, an email is better than throwing it in the comments. The other way you can do it, on your on the Friends website, there's a safety reporting form. Like a, any kind of safety report, you see something unsafe and you think it needs to be reported, you can go in there and plug it in. You could put that in there as a safety report. Like, here's my name, I got a tick, here's what happens. And then that will go to uh, Tracy and then over here, and then she'll get it to me. So, and then we'll probably come back for some more info, but um, that's how you do it with any safety info, not just ticks. So I got to put the tick word out there this year because they're bad. So Promethean, off, gators, Tuck your socks and your shoes and your pants and your socks. <laughs> Tuck your socks and your shoes too. Yeah. <laughs> Tuck's better. Um, okay. So volunteer, what do you what are the benefits? Okay, besides just it's a really cool thing to do, you know, and you feel good afterwards and it's really great support of the park. What do you get? Right? What's in it for me? So 
you get um, an annual pass for the park. Okay, all of our active volunteers. We won't have to have you go buy a pass to volunteer. So we're going to. Uh, you'll be on the list to go over, stop into the visitor center, get a pass. It's actually a sticker now for staff and volunteers. We went to stickers, so you'll get a stick. And it, it, it is an annual pass, but it's a sticker. Um, you get. It, then there's our mark after that for getting some of these things like Dune dollars, we call them. Um, so at 50 hours, you get 15 Dune dollars that are good in the um, bookstore. So you can go in the Eastern National and pick out a t-shirt or a book or something. At 250 hours, um, you earn a National Park America the Beautiful Pass, which is the volunteer pass for, it's an annual pass to all the parks. Um, which is, that's an awesome deal right there. That's, I think, $80 for an annual pass for all the parks. And then at uh, 500 hours, we get you one of these name tags, one of these nifty name tags. And then at every 1,000 hours, you get your name tag on today, Carrie? Um, no, I well, okay. Tracy does. Tracy. Yeah. Yeah, so you get one of those nifty name tags with the VIP thing on it. And then after 1,000, you get, um, they're called rockers, like a little thing that goes underneath it that says, hey, how many 1,000 hours you got? And that's why I asked you, Carrie, because Carrie's got... Uh, a couple, it's, it's so many, it's name tags. Like, <laughs> literally, you guys, he has, I think, 21,000 plus hours. Yeah, it's ridiculous. So we're out doing stuff all the time together, and people are like, you should hire him. Like, no way, we can't afford the overtime. <laughs> so, so yeah, um, all right, good. Any questions for me before we turn over to the, oh, go ahead, yeah. Matt. Okay, you'll think of it. All right, Matt. Yes. Just when you go into the visitor center yep. to get your pass, be sure to take your car license number with you. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you'll have to go back to your car, write it down, and come back inside. Right. And we would all know nobody wants to walk in a park. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's good <laughs> advice. You definitely need your license plate number now. Would you repeat the questions because they can't? Oh, answer. right. What was the last question? So my question that I forgot now I remember was that the day's train counts as an hour. Yeah. So especially if you're new, go in and log that because it takes a while for our volunteers to get the hours to match. And he doesn't give you the free pass until it's posted. So right. get that hour in there today. Yeah. yeah. Two hours. And two. Two. two hours. Two okay. hours. Yeah. Two hours. Three. It's like work from the time you leave home. So you go to Think of it how you log out of Question back here. Yes, yep, that's on there. Um, yep, no, nope, it's on there. And, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, who are the third party vendors for passes was the question. And it is on the website. Um, I mean, for example, uh, it's uh, Riverside and Crystal River and, and Manitou Island Transit are three places to pass. I think there's okay. others, though. Is Eastern National still a pass? No, not yet. We're trying to have that happen um, because it would be helpful to have the pass in Glen Haven and at the Duke line. Um, right now, Eastern's a very large company, and so you got to work through their hierarchy to get that to happen. But yeah, we would really like that to happen, but not yet. A Eastern, the question was, East, does Eastern sell? I'm sorry. Connection of your volunteer hours, is that a yearly thing or is that like? So, uh, you know, it's a complicated question. So, yeah, so the annual hours, so the, we work on fiscal year, so October till September 30th. Um, the hours for the Doom Bucks and almost, really almost everything else, it isn't that complicated actually, are, are that season. But the 250 hour pass that VIP um, America the Beautiful pass is cumulative. So, I mean, you, you do, you know, say whatever, pick a number, uh, 75 hours or wherever that adds up to. When you cross 250 that season, your next, that 75 that puts you across 250, I'll mail you that um, VIP pass. So, yep. If you volunteer directly to the park service, yep. and also to the system there, how do you report? The yep, hour? that's a great question. So the question is, if you have, if you volunteer more than one opportunity, say a Glen Haven um, docent or the um, park rangers or the bot squad, which all need people, so if you're interested on those, let me know. Um, how do you report hours? Okay, so the friends hours have to go through their website because 
we want to track those as friends of Sleeping Bear Dew hours, mm -hmm. Sleeping Bear Dunes hours. So when you get back from whatever adopted trail, heritage trail, that kind of thing, go on their website to report the other programs, report how your lead prefers you to report, which probably be directly to them. They, they likely keep an Excel sheet and most of them do and then give me that every so often. So report to your lead and then, you know, with worst case, email me because <laughs> I'll take hours however they come. Um, but yeah, your program, all other programs want to be able to track those hours too. So yeah, um, so good question though. Yep. Uh, let them know about no partial hours. Right, good, good point. So the hours as Kathy mentioned, um are from the time you leave your house till the time you get back as long as you don't go to target for four hours in the middle um but yeah normally it's just travel time both sides and your time you're volunteering but i don't do decimals right so this is there's too many uh moving parts to this job and the decimals are not one of them that i'm willing to deal with so if you give me a 1.3 it's two i'm just putting two so you might as well put two so um that's that's all there is to it so don't bother with decimals <laughs> it's full hours which website is the uh, information on Friends of Sleeping Bear News. Oh, the fee. Is, oh, the, fee. Uh, the Park Service website. Did I just check? I did not see Riverside listed on the maybe I missed that Yeah, maybe. <laughs> Riverside's complicated. <laughs> I thought they were selling passes this year. I didn't see another one. So, uh, okay. But, yeah. Well, I Riverside, Crystal River, and, and Manitou Island Transit are historically. For sure, who are third parties? Um, I, I mean, I thought Riverside is going through. They may not. I don't know what's going on down there. That's yep. Oh my baby, where's Scott when you need him? She needs to answer that question. Under the Volunteer Service Agreement, um, are we individuals or are we a group? Yep, you are an individual. Asking on the Volunteer Service Agreement, which box do you check? Individual or group? Yes, you are an individual. Yeah. Is actually Sleeping Bear Dunes, but that's fine if you put friends. It's not, yeah, the form, the top of that form is fine. I mean, even if you were to click group, it's not a big deal. I know you're an individual and I'll get her. That's just so you can get you in the database. That's what so. Yep. Yep. The back is really the important part. Click the right boxes and then sign to. Also, okay, I got the big hook. Yes, I know. Uh -huh. Okay, good. So uh, let's introduce uh, who, which one you guys are. Both of you, one other. Well, let me uh, let me do. Let me ask uh, Tessa and uh, Chelsea to come up. Oh, okay. All right. Good deal. All right. Thank you guys again. Uh, hey, hey, yeah. All right. <laughs> yep. Come on. Up. So these guys are in uh, obviously part employees and they're working on um, resource protection and they're going to tell you a little bit about the clovers and uh, what else dark rangers and whatever else they want to talk about there you go yeah hi guys uh, my name is tess polar this is chelsea loomis we are both um, in natural resources on what's called the clover crew we go out and monitor piping clover they're endangered species they kind of look like this kind of animal, <laughs> vaguely. Um, I also have a picture that might be a little hard to see. This is a piping clover for at least those of you like that. Um, so they're a critically endangered shorebird, um, and we are accumulating volunteers to help us protect their nesting grounds, which is the beach. They really like the same beaches that we like to recreate on. They like to dig little tiny holes in the sand and throw their eggs in and say, hey, this is where I'm nesting. And so we need help um, making sure they have protected areas to nest and raise their chicks. Their chicks are really cute. This might be kind of hard to see. They blend in really well with the beach, which is part of the difficulty. But I don't want to see their stuff close. Pass around. That's so and yeah, pass around. Like rocks. <laughs> yeah. And their eggs look like rocks. Here's a picture of an egg. A horrid nest. You can pass that. It's around. amazing how how <laughs> camouflaged these things are, right? Yeah. So we have a couple elements of our program. Um, we're expanding it this year. We're trying some new things. Our Bark Rangers program has been around for a little while. Um, I think I see a couple of Bark Rangers in the crowd um, and some Plover ambassadors as well. So Bark Rangers, we use dog owners to patrol beaches that are open to dogs to let other dog owners or pet owners know what the rules are in the park when it comes to pets. 
um, bagging your pet waste, keeping your leash on, recreating in places open to pets, um, and respecting wildlife are the four big tenets. So if you have a dog and you're interested in volunteering with your dog, um, we are the people to talk with. Um, we also are having folks without dogs in spaces where we have a lot of um, wildlife human interactions happening. So people wanting to be on the beach in places where the plover are navigating. Um, folks are gonna be out with some information. We have a bunch of little pamphlets and cards, just letting people know that there's an endangered species on the beach um, and letting them know how they can recreate in a way that's safe for both plovers and for people. Um, if you're a bark ranger, you get a cool shirt. Who holds the plover? You get a Careful cool with plover. Yeah, that's a trick too. Um, you get a cool shirt with cool logo, and your dog gets a cool vest. Um, and if you're so our other um, element, we kind of call our plover ambassador, plover and bandana. And you get a bandana. Like a right, Granger. Um, yeah, so you get to be on the beach, be part of this conservation effort, work with us uh, biologists, and have a good time. Is there anything you'd like to add, Jess? Do you want to talk about our plover? Like, if people are interested in volunteering for plovers as well? Um, so, in addition to our bark ranger program, um, we also have uh, groups of volunteers monitoring the beaches, um, looking for our plovers as well. Beaches we're not really able to get to often, and just you know, keeping an eye out for the little birds. And we'll also be holding a training on this as well um, and a kickoff event. And do you want to share the data on that? Yeah, sure. So we're um, hosting a kickoff event and a training. Both are going to be in this same building. Kickoff is May 31st at 6.30. The training is June 10th at 10.30 a.m. Um, I have a piece of paper with that written down. You can come take a picture of it or um, we'll also be collecting emails if you are really interested um, and we'll get you looped into our information. You can have our newsletter. You can know anything you want to know about plovers in the park. We're here <laughs> to provide that information. Are plovers on North and South Manitou? Um, they're on North Manitou. Um, they haven't nested on South in a couple of years. How many uh, pairs did you have last year and have they returned yet? Yeah, sure. Uh, so the question was, how many pairs of plovers did we have nesting in the park last year? And the answer to that was 33. And yes, they have returned and they're already putting their nest in. So we're very busy. <laughs> yeah, I think we have 10 nests on the mainland so far. And how many on the island? We have, I think there are nine on North Manitou currently. Yeah. So 19 nests. <laughs> and how many of those eggs will survive? Um, well, so we, the way that we quantify it is fledgling success rate. So a baby, baby chick is able to fly. That means they fledged. And I think last year in the park, it was just over two out of each four egg nest. So about half. Which is great. Which is really good. Which is really great. Very good. You guys going to hang around here for a while so that if somebody wants to sign up with you, you'll be available, yep. right? Yep, we will have um, some information for you and we have a sign-up sheet as well if you wanna find us. Excellent, cool. thank you very much. All right, so we have, Friends of Sitting Bear Dunes has been doing a fair amount of work to um, support the, the Plover program. Uh, this year we have um, grants that we've uh, written grant applications for a total of thirty-six thousand dollars to to buy equipment and uh, and pay for staffing for um, over protection. As a result of that, I'm going to hand the microphone over to Jerry here a second. Yeah. So uh, as a result of that, um, the uh, park staff, uh, Clover staff, wants to do a little thank you uh, for the friends. So uh, on the 23rd of this month, 23rd of May, which is a Tuesday, they're having Clover Day. Now, this is not open to the general public. This is only for Friends members, but you would all be yeah. uh, invited. And there will be an email coming out with the, with the details. But uh, at the park headquarters in the auditorium at 11 a.m., uh, there will be a presentation, a chance to meet 
to people who work on this program. And then following that, we'll adjourn to the beach uh, and there'll be a chance to actually look at the piping plovers and see how they uh, are protected. So it'll be pretty interesting if you're interested in, uh, in the uh, plovers and a good chance to uh, decide whether you, you might like to get more involved as these ladies are talking about volunteering to help on this program. Thank you for your presentation there. We were able to purchase two new belts for our program, which is a huge deal for me. Uh, so I just want to thank you, Brent. You are welcome for those two scopes. <laughs> we, um, so I delivered them out to uh, Vince's office and then put them in his office. He wasn't there that day. And before I left the building, the scopes were gone. <laughs> so, yeah, which is uh, which is good. That means that uh, they were are being used well. So thank you very much for that. Um, one other resource uh, related. Our project is um, our bot squad, the botulism, avian botulism team. And uh, that's Erica Plesha manages that. They need volunteers. So if you um, have time and would like to block a certain segment of beach, we call it a transect, every week. But you can, you know, I think Erica is, is willing to have you do it like every other week and have somebody else do the off weeks. Um, these transects tend to be about two miles long, and um, they're the entire uh, range of, on the mainland of uh, Sweet Bear Dunes National Lakeshore. So starting down an in old Indian uh, trail all the way up to uh, Good Harbor. And so we're doing two, like one and a half to two mile segments. But we're looking, you're taking a walk on the beach looking for dead birds. Last year, we only had a few dead birds, so it was basically take a nice walk on the beach every week. That's a tough, tough duty being a volunteer. Um, when I was doing, doing it, and I'm kind of an um, alternate in case they don't have somebody, uh, I do adopt the beach and plover at the same time. Or not plover, uh, bot squad. Yeah. So, but we are, Erica does need some more volunteers for bot squads. Okay, um, now, so Paul and Micah, can you guys come up? So one of the things that, that happens when you, you are out in the park, you are actually the eyes and ears of the park service when you're out in the park, because we don't have enough staff to be able to be everywhere all the time. But with you know, two or 300 volunteers, you actually do get pretty darn good coverage. So what happens when you see something that doesn't look right? How do you get it reported? Who do you talk to? How do you deal with uh, visitors that uh, may be not following the rules? So I'm gonna turn it over to you guys. Okay. Hi, I'm Paul. Good to see everybody here. Thanks for all that you do to help out the park. You guys do make that. Oh, You're gonna have to get closer to the mic. Closer to the mic. Yeah, there you go. I don't think the mic's on. Actually, is the mic on? Is it on? Yeah, it's on. There you go. You're, you're gonna <laughs> just, just put it there. Is that better? Can you hear no. me? Yes, you can just hold it. I'm gonna turn it off when I touch it. All right, fine. No, down. We gotta move. You gotta talk on. <laughs> Maybe is this better? Yeah, I can try and do it this way. Okay. That's good. Uh, thanks for what you folks do. You do make a big difference in the park. Um, it, it, Definitely noticeable with the PSAR program, other things that have been uh, pick, picking up over the years, the park ranger program, uh, all those things. Uh, I love to see it in the park. Uh, so thank you for that. Uh, as far as getting a hold of us, if you get into an emergency situation in the park, something's going on that needs to be taken care of. I did leave some information in the back, a handout here that I'm holding. Uh, there's not going to be enough for everybody in the room. So I don't know if it's been shared with you already, Matt, but I'll try and see if Andy can send you this file yeah. just to get it out, maybe in a PDF email or something. But this is just a general guide to kind of help you understand uh, different levels of urgency. Uh, if it's a 911 emergency, though, it just comes down to calling 911 if you're able to do so. That is the best way if you're trying to get a hold of a ranger to try and deal with something, trying to get emergency services to come deal with something, call 911. 
Uh, if things are working out well with the signal, they're going to know where you're located. They're going to ask you questions and try and make sure they get the right resources coming to help you out. Uh, there's only eight rangers that work in law enforcement in this park. One of them is a chief ranger out of headquarters. We have two field supervisors and we have one seasonal that we bring in on the summertime. So limited numbers of people in our capacity to be out there trying to make sure people are respecting the rules of the park, trying to make sure people are being safe with the resources. Uh, so that is again where volunteers make a big difference. Uh, folks are saying you guys in numbers uh, can see a lot of things out there. Uh, things that we want to know about, like I said, 911 emergencies are important. Uh, we get a lot of common violations in the park. Uh, if it's something, a typical violation that's not necessarily uh, important enough to call 911 to get us to come deal with, we got a lot of things going, but it'd be something to pass on in your, your daily notes. Just uh, it's beneficial for us in that sense because uh, it can give us trends. So if we have an area where we're having a lot of dog off leash issues, uh, those notes get passed on. They get passed on to my supervisor. Uh, we try to have operational meetings for our districts periodically, and he does pass that information on to us uh, as it gets to him. So there's a benefit to that. Um, if it's important, but maybe not something that you feel like I should call 911, it's not urgent enough, Another option that you have that's on this form is a non-emergency number to Leelong County Dispatch, Benton County Dispatch. Usually makes people feel a little more comfortable when you give out that option because they go, oh, I'm not calling 911. Uh, it's Could less of an emergency. Example, please. Uh, uh, so it would be less than a 911 call, uh, example. Yeah, uh, like a simple issue of dog off leash. That that wouldn't be something to call 911. What's that? Drones. Drones. That's another common one. People collecting rocks. Tent in the middle. The tent in the middle of the woods. That wouldn't be a 911 emergency. There's really no urgency. There could be an impact to visitor enjoyment, to the resource in a way, um, but it's not really to that level. That may be that non emergency call uh, or some of it, like the rocks, um, the, the dogs off leash, if it's not in a piping clover area uh, where nesting and stuff's going on. Um, that could just be a simple pass up in your notes. Uh, that stuff happens all the time in the park. We deal with it pretty regularly. Um, so just be mindful of that. Yes, question. You mean like reporting a bear or a lion? Uh, reporting wildlife sightings. That's an option where you can get a hold of the visitor center. They take uh, wildlife report forms. If you happen to catch one of us in the field, we try to carry around. A form that way. I can go on the notes too. Go on the notes. Yeah, okay, the notes, and then okay. I'll forward it. And I can. Okay. Um, something else. Just try and fit some of the stuff on here. Our, our park is broken up into two uh, two districts for the law enforcement operations: Leelanau District and the Flat River District. Uh, the Flat River District extends up to Empire. Most of the district is in Benton County, but um, you know, down off the south end by Round Lake, heading up to the visitor center, center in Empire. That's part of the Flat River District. The Leelanau District, where Mike and I work, we're everything north for the park uh, in the Leelanau County section. So uh, that's something as you're passing on information in your notes, try and note where you are and give some good detail that helps us figure things out when we're trying to look into things. So um, that's kind of the highlights on this. It's a good form. If you get a chance to check it out, like I said, there's a few in the back there. Um, as far as, yes. Well, a lot of people have pencils. Give them the non emergency numbers so they can. Yeah, I can do that. Okay. Uh, Leelanau County Dispatch Non Emergency Number 231 256 8800. Anybody need me to repeat that? No, please. 231. 256-8800. What is this number for? It's, it's for non-emergency. Non it, it, it will go to, you will be talking to a dispatcher for okay. Leelanau County. Okay. Uh, same thing if you're calling that non-emergency number for Benzie County. You're not tying up the 911 um, right. switchboard, which is a good thing if, if there's a lot of things going on in the county. Um, that's a benefit there. So for Benzie County, that number is 231-882. 
Those are certainly good to utilize them. What was that again? I'm sorry. Oh. What do we got here? 231 882 4487. We got 231 256 County, yep. Uh, as far as interacting with the public in, in your folks' capacity, if you're volunteering, if you're doing the Bark Ranger program, some of those other ones where you're you're having a lot of public interaction, public contact with the visitors. Um, sometimes you may encounter things where uh, somebody's breaking the law, um, they're up to no good, uh, there's some kind of impact to the resource, something along those lines, dog off leash, um, collecting rocks are common ones. Uh, you know, a lot of that is, I'd say when it comes to helping us out is up to your personal comfort as far as uh, engaging in that. Uh, I'm going to assume if you're a bark ranger, we kind of understood that that's going to be part of being in that program, that you're going to be out there trying to educate. And that's really what it comes down to is your role in that capacity is education. Mike and I's role in what we do is education uh, in a different way. Ours is enforcement. So um, we can do things that you can't do. Uh, your role is just to educate, give them the information. If they don't seem to be receptive to it, then there may not be a point in continuing to try to educate them. That would be my best uh, way to look at it, to give it to you is uh, if somebody becomes argumentative, then that, that's a good time to say, okay, you know, I, I've given you some information, take care, have a good day and walk away. You don't need to continue to press the issue. Um, you don't need to say, hey, I'm gonna call law enforcement. Um, that, that can be an escalation. Just try to stay level in tone, calm, and uh, give what you can give as far as that initial information. And if it's not well received, then um, then just move on. And, and if it's serious enough, you can pass it on. If you guys have like daily supervisors that you check in, uh, check in with them, they can pass it on to us, do it that way. You can put it in your notes that you had uh, a contact where somebody wasn't receptive to the information that you gave. And uh, we can just kind of add that current control um, activities. If, uh, if you do get something like that where somebody's not receiving something well, um, like if it was a dog off leash, uh, a good description of the dog, the person, uh, good descriptions are great for us if it's something that we're going to try and look into later or if we're going to keep an eye out, you know, certainly for that, uh, just to be mindful of it. Um, that's really the best way to look at it when it comes to what your role is. Yes. No, I just I just had a question about the well, I heard different things about the rock collecting yeah. rule. What actually is that rule? You cannot collect rocks in Sleeping Bear Dunes National Lake Shore. A lot of folks don't understand that. And um it's uh in state lands, and I don't know the specifics of the state rules. You can typically collect say 25 pounds a year. A lot of people think we're a state park when they're visiting the lake shore. So there's usually some confusion there, um, but the Dotsky stones uh, are pretty common. Uh, I had a lady a couple of days ago that had two five gallon buckets and a couple of two and a half gallon buckets full of rocks. So wow. you get you get the simple, a couple rocks here in the pocket and then uh, she was working on setting up a garden. But that's usually when it's that much, that's usually what they're, what they're up to. So good question, yeah. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, medical information. As far as situation, like if you're dealing with a, if you get a report of a medical or you're, you see a medical situation going on, um, how to report it or what are you looking for in that? Do you look at say where you don't need a 911? Do you go to the dispatch and and let them know that you uh, what the situation is to let them make a decision as to whether it's 911 or whether it's worthy of of sending people out. So yeah. if, if you see something that's like looks like a medical, you know, and there's trauma, uh, different different types of emergencies that are going on. Uh, if it looks like somebody may need help, they may need an EMT, a paramedic, they may need to go to the hospital, that would be calling 911. Uh, if it's just a simple first aid issue to where maybe they just need a Band-Aid, they've got some scrapes or something, if they fell down, um, if there's any chance that you may have hit their head, that would be something where we would want 911 to be called up. Can you, can you change on that? Uh, yeah. The person usually 
um, injured could answer that question. I don't, I don't think people can hear you. Can, can you guys hear me? Yeah. 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 It's a sensitive. It's gotta be like, yeah. it's it's up. Up. Um, the person with the emergency could hopefully handle that answer. That happens often on the heritage trail. You see a bike wreck. Hey, are you okay? Uh, I think so. Do you need me to call 911? No. Um, maybe they have uh, a way to get care for themselves. But if they say yes, you can initiate that call and then be a good witness and then be a good bystander uh, at that time. The dispatcher will ask you all the questions they need to know. Um, so you don't need to give them you know, a, a life story. You just need to be able to answer the questions that they'll, they'll ask and uh, we'll have help coming from the right direction. There are plenty of um, medical emergencies that happen in the park that we don't have any record of because people are able to get self care. Um, so that is, you, you folks can be a filter for some of that too. If you see an emergency, be that 911 activation or report it in your log. Because if you do see a bike wreck, that could be something to report also. Um, it is. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah it, it becomes reported, but maybe isn't necessarily a 911 medical call or an not emergent call. Did that answer your question? Yes. Okay, great. Yeah. Paul and Michael, would you say, do not treat people above your ability or training. Yes. Yeah. Only for liability for. Yeah. Absolutely. Don't go beyond your level of training when it comes to assisting people. Yes, sir. I don't know if you can answer this question or not, but that indicated last year, a lot of times, for example, the, the feed loop at the new line wasn't open. And it sounds like it's going to be a lot more times this year. Yes. And uh, a lot of times I get people that were going to. They hike to the lake, which is in some cases three or four hours, and they've got everything out of the car and they're ready to go. And they come up to me and they say, I don't have my car. Uh, and I don't know if you've been able to answer this. How strictly are you going to enforce those rules this year? Okay. And I don't know if you can answer. Yes. Oh, uh, I send it back and say, Well, you can't hike the 24 hours. <laughs> <laughs> no. So the, the question is, is getting the basis of the question is getting to with our limited fee operations, the availability of getting a park pass. Uh, how strictly are we enforcing that rule um, to have a pass before you can recreate it? Uh, my general approach when I deal with people, even when those locations are fully staffed, uh, is I say, hey, um, just get the pass when you get a chance. Go enjoy the park, have a good time. They're taking the responsibility to say, hey, I want to get one. Uh, I'm going to give them the trust that they're going to go get it after the fact. Sure. And yeah, it's just informational. Since we don't have an option there for them, um, just let them go get it when they get a chance. Yeah. So if, if they're on foot, do they still need a park pass? You still need a park pass to recreate in the park. So uh, that gets to a point that it's common. People think park pass is parking. It's, rec it's a recreational pass. So. Uh, if you if you got dropped off, you technically need to have a park pass with you. I don't make it a regular habit to go up to people hiking and say, "Hey, can I see your pass?" <laughs> it's on the dash, and, uh, but that's the technical. Yeah, technically, you would have to have it with you. Now that's the question that I get. Do you leave the pass in the car, or do you take it with you? Leave it on the dash. Yep, in the back here. There are people which are going to take two dogs up the incline. And they were on leave yeah. if they were going to go up the incline. Okay. And um, they handled okay, but I had to ask myself after they weren't going to take the dogs in the But after we had they, you know, objected to the information, what would have happened? I mean, what, how would that have involved the situation? So, getting to the question of if, if volunteers, address somebody who's got a dog that's about to commit a violation of the park like going up the face of the dune climb that's prohibited um and they continue on what to do about it that's i wouldn't i wouldn't call 911 for it no. that would be a just a notation that it happened um sometimes the advantage is when um the booth is manned so when people are working it uh, they could be a, a point of contact you could say hey this has happened um, would you be able to notify the rangers? But a lot of that stuff happens pretty frequently. Yeah, okay. I was curious if you had to happen if they had gone in. Then 
so part of the thing with with the dune pond that's kind of a, a challenging area is, is you can have dogs on the dune trail you just can't have them on the face of the dune pond so i run into that issue quite a bit where people are that's their intention is to go hiking uh and the only offer i have for them and you may offer that to other people is uh, if you can come up into the dunes another way when you're allowed to be up there there's closures right now for sleep bear point trail um, so people wouldn't be able to come in there. Uh, we have that in place right now. Um, but you can come in off the Cottonwood Trail and, and come in off the scenic drive and then cross over to the Dune Trail. Yes, sir. And the uh, Is there a policy on photographing violence? So, or yeah, good question. So, when I when I talk to you, okay, is there a policy on photographing people committing a violation of the park or vehicle plates? Uh, I always encourage people when they mention that that's something they're willing to do is don't do anything unnecessary that puts you in risk. Uh, when it comes to pulling out a camera, uh, that can escalate things. So if you're dealing with somebody that's being confrontational and you pull out your phone, start recording things, I, that, that may not be worth it. It, you know, we will follow up later, but if, if if the situation feels okay to you and you, you feel okay to, to do that, uh, just try and use good judgment. I guess it's a balance there. That does help us. So when it comes to our enforcement, a lot of the violations we deal with, if we see it, it's easier for us to charge somebody for it. Uh, and if I see it in a photo, I didn't have to have been there, but if I see somebody doing something wrong in a photo, I can say where it is, then I have the option to charge uh, if, if it needs to go that way. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Anything to add? Uh, I'll just add something. When, when you guys are contacting those visitors, we'll use your example with the, the dogs at the dune farm. You can throw us under the bus. You can approach it in a friendly way and say, I'm just trying to tell you that this isn't allowed or please keep your dog on a leash. I know there's rangers right over there and they give tickets for this violation. Yeah. You you can do that. You can use us for that. Uh, sometimes that can be pretty effective. Uh, use us as a bag of those, please. Oh <laughs> it can vary. Yeah. Their eye, yeah. Yeah, man. Uh, awesome. Yeah. Right here, man. How about dogs and our pets and cars? Whether 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 should we be moving in this situation? So what what about the hot dog in the car? <laughs> Yes, um, that's going to be a challenge with the dune pond not being staffed because uh, regularly is sometimes they can kind of rule some of that out. But um, we do get some calls where when we go check it out, it, there's nothing for us to do. Uh, if the windows are cracked down, there's water available. Depending on what the temperature is outside, uh, those dogs may actually be okay. But you get a lot of calls for a hot dog in a car that there's really nothing for us to do because the people have taken some measures to make sure that dog is okay. So, um, but when it's hot out, that car is going to be hotter, and um, that could be a call to 911. We get a, we get a few of those if if it rises that level. We get quite a few at the Dune Climb, just a general location there, and I think it typically comes down to the fact that people figure out they can't take their dog up the face of the dunes and they say, well, I'm just going to leave the dog in the car while we go hiking without thinking about it. So does that answer your question? Okay. Um, in the great best, did you have a question here earlier or a minute ago? Okay. Yes. I have a question. Um, I know when people are violating the rules, we don't want that to happen. Yeah. But I'm a little uncomfortable. Um, if it seems like people are going to be going around snapping pictures of people who are violating the rules without their knowledge, I, you know, it's not like, I don't know if okay. I'm like, but that, what, uh, what do you have to say about that? So, to address the right to privacy, I guess, is maybe your question, is it okay to take pictures of people violating the rules? If you're in public, um, you have a reduced expectation of privacy. So, uh, if and we do come up against this on a more inappropriate side. If somebody's doing something illegal, uh, is it really a violation of their privacy to catch them in the act? Um, they may think so because they may get in trouble later, but uh, usually we're dealing with that where people are being uh, creepy 
uh, lurking around, taking inappropriate photos of visitors on the beach, things like that, um, to where that rises to a level of expectation of privacy, but it's challenging when you're out in public. It's, yeah, that one's, yeah. Anything to add to that one? No, that, that okay. I'm not quite sure what all the rules are for the park. Is there a place online yeah. where I can find all the rules? Some, sometimes I have a hard time. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it can be challenging, but the basis of it, uh, I'll, I'll try to be brief on this explanation, but the main offenses that we enforce in the park are covered under 36 CFR, 36 Code of Federal Regulations, parts one through seven. So <laughs> if you can remember that, uh, you can Google uh, CFR National Park Service and it should come up uh, as that. But those are the core regulations that we enforce out of. Uh, certain regulations allow us to simulate state law for traffic when we're dealing with uh, motor vehicle uh, driving offenses. We have a CFR that allows us to assimilate a state charge uh, if we don't have a federal charge. We can also assimilate state laws under certain, um, certain cases under the Assimilated Crimes Act because most of our park is concurrent jurisdiction. Uh, that allows us to pull in state charges if we don't have a federal charge that we can apply. The other big thing I think is important for people to know here locally is what's called the superintendent's compendium. That's available on the park's website. I think it's kind of tricky to find it, um, but if you go on our NPS website, I believe last time I was looking for it on there, it was under management. Uh, and then laws and policies, and then the superintendent and this compendium would be tucked in that section. The superintendent's compendium, this park uh, has unique circumstances where it may want to restrict things that another park site wouldn't want. They, they wouldn't want anything to do with that kind of restriction. Uh, but the superintendent's compendium, it's authorized by that 36 CFR. Uh, to put in certain special restrictions to protect this resource. So uh, that's where you get into some of the stuff that people may have a harder time understanding, but we can we can get our heads spinning talking about it. Yeah. So, yeah. All right. So um, these guys, Paul and Mike, are going to hang around here for a while after we break up. One thing that, one first aid, I just want to talk first aid clarification. Okay. Okay. Is, uh, so, yeah. Uh, Matt, come on. Matt, pull up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, if you come across something, um, uh, emergency first aid looking like it's going to be required or whatever, a uh, heart attack or a bike wreck, okay, you do not have to respond to that. You have a duty to report it. That's it. That's your, your duty as a volunteer, wearing the vest or actively volunteer, you have to report it. You have to stay there. You have to report it. You don't have to treat them. Even if you're uh, qualified, you don't have to. And then treat up to your, your level, level of training, right? And then otherwise, if you want to, but you don't have to. So but you do have to report. Speaking of level of training, do you offer any kind of CPR classes or anything like that? We do. Um, and Talk to your lead and they can give me the list of names. We're still taking names this year. This is just going back to is there any ski regulations for e bikes on the trail here? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so it's been a while. So the question is is there a speed regulation on e bikes? And this has, this has come up ever since e bikes became an option on the trail. There's a lot of background stuff. You get into the complication of the law question. Uh, I don't, I'm not recalling a hard restriction on speed right no, now. There it's, it's something that could be potentially in the future. And I know it's come up. Yeah, it's usually so right now there's no, no restriction. Okay. You're yeah. the expert on this one. I am. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But you know, you, you're going to, microphone. Yeah. You, you're going to want to make sure that. Uh, if you're seeing somebody going past, you ask them to slow down because it's it's basically you know a safety issue for them as well as for other people on the trail. But there is no particular speed limit. We don't have a speed limit. I, I know on the Leonard Trail they do put a speed limit on, but to try to enforce that would be a nightmare. So uh, we we do not have that. 
And you guys are going to be able to stick around for a few minutes? Yeah. Okay, so um, we're going to break here into our groups. And if you have questions for... Uh, yeah, yeah. Wait a second. Uh, so they'll be around that you can ask individual questions for. So, um, yeah, I, okay. Everybody wants, to, but I've got, I've got an order in my mind. Yeah. All right. So, Jesse, come on up. Thank you, guys. Yeah, thank you. You're on, man. So first, I have to apologize to Jerry. I thought he was going straight to the breakout no. sessions. And, <laughs> no, I, I didn't. So I don't think know better by now. <laughs> anyway, my name is Jesse. And for the past three years, I've been the coordinator for Friends for the Preventive Search and Rescue Program. I moved up here in 2019 and immediately fell in love with Sleeping Bear as I you know, visited many times as a kid and I wanted to give back. So one of the things that, uh, one of the reasons I'm here today because not every program has the opportunity to make a personal plea, is that we're on, we've had some tre tremendous momentum for the past three years in our program. In 2021, we contacted around 17,000 visitors between Memorial Day and Labor Day, with usually a group of about 10 volunteers or less. 2021, we contacted 23,000. And last year, we contacted 33,000 people. Um, all again, between Memorial Day, Labor Day, with about with under 10 hardcore committed, at least somewhat committed volunteers. So, um, and fortunately, not more committed at the end from all the people. Too. Um, so we feel incredibly proud of what we've been able to do with the small staff. And uh, even more impressive is, is the statistics. And I wasn't around for the onset of the program in 2016, but back then, as Carrie alluded to earlier, Sleeping Bear Dunes had one of the highest rates of search and rescues of any national park property in the country. Uh, we were in either the top five or top ten. I'm not sure which. But we beat Yellowstone, Grand Canyon, Tetons, Price Canyon, all the ones that attract you know millions and billions of visitors each year. So um, the leaders back then saw that as a problem and they copied a program that was initiated at uh, Grand Canyon, and that's the Peace Act program. And so. Um, we're not rescuers. We focus on the prevention of search and rescue. We don't, we don't use ropes, we don't use pecans, we don't have our own helicopter, we go out and grab people. Um, but we do start the back base. And we do that by having to as many people as we can. Um, is this going in and out or is it just what I'm hearing? Oh, you're good. Okay, that's good. Thank you. Um, so we have uh, our volunteers range in age and ability. So uh, we try to, to match our needs with their needs. Um, one of the, the things that particularly since the pandemic came around that, uh, that has happened is Park Service has been challenged in getting enough volunteers to, to staff all their positions. Matt alluded that to earlier about the booths, but that is a primary point of information for people coming in. And uh, the lines are long. They don't like to talk. They can talk to people, but they hold other people up when they're doing that. So, Got to use to get people to flow through. So that often our piece our volunteers are the primary source of information about the park in general, and in particular about the risks and the dangers that are on the dunes. Uh, so we ask that our people will try to take the time to, to meet with everybody we come in contact with and take the time to make their visitor enjoyable. And we have an additional handicap this year in uh, this. Hard as they tried, the National Park Service wasn't able to fill a full time position that they had to support the Peace Time program. So we will be doing more work we were like with me and uh, Micah, who just stepped out. And he doesn't know how much I'm going to rely on him, but uh, he'll find out as the weeks go on. So we am really concerned that we're going to lose that. Yeah. As I mentioned earlier, um, we, the number of search and rescues has gone down incredibly. So just giving you that in 2016, when the program was started, there was again, between Memorial Day and Labor Day, there were 31 full fledged search and rescues and 56 911 calls. And these are just to the scenic overlook and it didn't come along, uh, including the rest of the park. Uh, 2021, the number of search and rescues had dropped to 10. And the number of 911 calls was seven. 
And you've got to remember too that that year also marked the highest attendance of this part of the district. So more people, fewer calls. Then last year, the number of search and rescues dropped all the way to eight, and we had five 911 calls. In fact, Andy Blake, one of the senior uh, rangers here, complained to me that he ran out of things to do during the day. Flights and sightings across the park. He's not here to take that. Pardon? He's not here to take that. No. <laughs> That's why I got away with it, right? <laughs> Um, but even more impressive is what we call hiker assists. And that's where, um, through our efforts, either um, down at the bottom or the top of one of the hills, we find people who are in distress. So in our effort to, to match our needs with the program needs and park needs with, with your ability, um, some people prefer to remain in one particular place, like maybe at the base of the new plant, or Jim Patton here will not work anywhere else but the scenic old road. <laughs> but and um, but others like myself and um, other volunteers like to walk up along the dunes. We take the carry taught me how to do this job, and he ends up post up in halfway or not halfway, about a third of the way along the dune trail, where we're able to see people as they come up, see how prepared they are, see how fit they are, and uh, provide a lot of assistance for them. But hiker assists are when people either bring it to our attention or we find people who are in trouble. And um, in 2021, that number was 33. Last year, that number was 53. So I look at each one of those hiker assists as a probable 911 call or search and rescue that we provide. So that's, that's an incredible impact on our guests and their ability for them and their families to enjoy the park. And it could have turned what could have been a disastrous day into an enjoyable effort. And that's really what our goal is. Um, so if you look at that number last year, 53 walkouts, we actually prevented more search and rescues and 911 calls than actually occurred. So that's an incredible statistics. And I think it says a lot to the, the people who, who are in the program. Um, so we focus on dune safety, provide first aid with a, with a applicable and within our comfort zone again. Um, we're also one of the more frequent groups to contact 911. And just to add what the ranger said, I used to be a police officer, I used to run a dispatch center as well. If you're in doubt about whether or not to call 911, they'll tell you that if they, they're gonna respond or not. And the most important thing is to get the help there. You may not be able to see their injuries. You may not be able to see that they're having, you know, they've injured their spine, back or spine in a fall. When in doubt, call and let them start it out. So um, that's kind of the principle we operate by. And as I said about Andy, kind of just running with his lights and sirens. So they'll keep the rangers happy. At least Andy will keep Andy happy as well. Um, so what, ex what commitment do we expect from our volunteers? And that is whatever you want to, whatever you want to commit. Uh, we have no minimum hours that you have to serve. We have, you want to work, work one day a week, that's fine. You want to work five days a week, so I'll probably buy lunch for you because it'll be so ecstatic. Uh, if you want to work one day a month, that's fine too. Uh, we do all our signups online. There's an app. And uh, if you get involved in the program, we'll provide you information on that. You pick your schedule, you pick where you want to be, you pick the time you want to work. And then the only other thing we require is that you report back to us at the end of your shift so that we know, know about any incidents that happen. Uh, we can monitor your going. Work very closely with the Park Service all year long. So, if any of you who are working for us bring up issues, they definitely get attended to. And if not, I expect a phone call from you to tell me to do my job. So, um, and you know, one of the most rewarding things for me about doing this position, the reason I want to get coordinated, is because of the people that I work with and the things we get to do to change people's lives. So I'm going to single out two people who've been in the program far longer than I have. The two gyms we call them, we call them the bookends. Jim Patton, uh, Mr. Scenic Overman. Um, when he first, when I first took over coordinator and saw how many people he was recording and reporting that he had met with that day, I thought he was making things up. I thought he was padding the stats. So if you don't know this figure, I went out and checked on him one day and I walked up that little hill from the parking lot and he had two bus loads of kids from elementary school, and he was lecturing about the history of sleeping there and dune safety. 
And that alone taught me how much one person could have on so many people in one day visiting the park. And it was, it, I don't know, I, it was when, I was when I first got here, and, I, and I'll never forget it. The other incident I'll never forget was because of the other end of the gyms, the other bookend, Jim Higgy, who not only worked for us at the Peace Art Program, but also volunteered times at the museum and probably other places too. Um, last year, uh, he had arrived in the morning. I arrived a little bit later, and we kind of stand out in these shirts. And when he saw me, he started waving his arms frantic at me, and I thought there was some emergency, so I hurried over there. And what he was trying to point out to me is a young man who was about 15 years old, who was a paraplegic, and he wanted to go to the top of the dune to see what everybody else saw. He hadn't heard of the track chair program, which would have helped him anyway. But so what this young man did, and it took him several hours, is crawled up the dune face of the dune climb using just his arms. And the entire way up, and when I saw him, he was halfway back down. You could see where his legs were being dragged behind him. He was coming down, he had the biggest smile on his face. And um, I immediately saw it, choked back to tears because I was so overwhelmed and called uh, my counterpart in the National Park Service, the Peace Art coordinator, told him to grab a couple of Peace Art shirts, grab anything the National Park Service on. We made him an honorary uh, Peace Art member that day and he was just as bad. And uh, I love that story because not only it shows the passion that people like Jim have, but it also shows how much nature can bring out the best of people. And you see that all the time here at the park. Um, so what are we looking for? We're looking for, for anyone and everyone. We're looking for you. Um, we want people who have knowledge about the park. We want people who care about other people, who care about the park, and are willing to share that care and that knowledge with, with all the strangers. On a typical day, we make contact anywhere from 100 to 500 people, depending on where you're at, depending on what time of year it is. And each individual person that you meet is actually a joy to work with. We also support the National Park Service and other events too. Um, every year they have an event in the park called um, M22 Challenge. Our volunteers support them in that. So that kind of like a triathlon of the birds running, biking, and boating within the park. Um, we participate in a Flat River Special Enforcement Detail. Um, participate in the Glen Haven Open House. We work very closely with the Glen Haven Fire Department. And we're working on a project right now so that anyone who's a member of the Peace Art team will be able to get certified in CPR and first aid if they're interested through their training um, at no charge. So um, the only the only other stipulation is we have one mandatory meeting, usually at the end of May, and we go over the parks rules and regulations, we urge rules and responsibilities, and um, share stories about Jim and Jim will go on and share stories about some of the high moments that they've had helping out over the years. So any questions? Just remember, we are completely flexible about schedule. You schedule on hours. So if you're trying and you want to share some time, quality time outdoors with your significant other, you can make that happen. If you're trying to spend out tournament time outdoors and getting away from your significant other, yeah. we can make that happen too. So again, we're very flexible. Uh, Danielle, who's one of our volunteers, and I will be out at the tent the truck. If you have any questions, we'd be happy to ask them. We also have some information cards for you. Um, please stop by either during the breakout session, so we'll be out there after that too. Thank you for your time. So, uh, the PCR program is looking for volunteers. Uh, if you're interested, you want to learn, learn a little bit more, you're going to be on the, the orange tent out in front. Um, I wanted to point out one of the things here. Uh, there's, there are a couple of these little booklets out there. Now, we have a book. Do you have the picture perfect book? So this book, Picture Perfect Sweet and Bear, has been available for the last year or so. And um, it's a it's a book that basically provides the history of Sweet Bear Dunes from visitor viewpoint. Um, so we collected a bunch of pictures from a lot of visitors, and some of you probably have your pictures in here. Um, and so we're selling this book 
as a bundle with a couple of other books. And now this year, um, we put together, Maggie put together a, um, a, a, a game activity book, book, which is, a, which is really great. It's got all kinds of, um, games in it, crossword puzzles, word searches that all relate to different pages in the book. So, um, this is available for, is it up on the website now? So you can download this for free off of our website. Um, if you're interested in buying the book or, or the bundle, that's available right here uh, with Kathy as well. So, uh, but it's, it's very cool. And I, I've done half the, uh, half the, the activities and um, I'm still working on some. <laughs> okay, yes, Mary. Um, as I understand it, the this book the activity book the activity book is available to download but we also have copies for sale is that correct if you yeah. already if you already no. have the sleeping bear picture available. pack perfect book it's only available for download okay yeah really now um any questions so far what am i missing did i miss anything yes so we're, we are going to have some breakouts, and it's for for you to go to the uh, area where you're volunteering. And we're going to try to keep it pretty short, so that if you want to volunteer for something else, you have a chance to go to the other breakout areas. Um, so Tracy is back here. Oh, by the way, a couple of other things. The, the vest, I, I just noticed that, that you're wearing the vest. As a volunteer, we, we want you to wear these vests, okay? Because with the badge on them, um, it, it indicates to visitors that you are an official volunteer for Sleeping Bear Dunes National Nation. So it is very visible. People have started to recognize that, the vest as being the, the sign that you're an official volunteer. And people will come to you and ask you questions because as, as we mentioned before, uh, park staff can't be everywhere all the time. And our volunteers, on the other hand, can do more. So if you haven't gotten a vest, pick one up. We have a whole tub full of them over here in, in the back of the room. So pick one of those up. So Tracy is our program manager for Adopt the Trail. And the breakout for that is going to be back in a little bit more room up here, right up in, right up in here. So that's about the trail. Uh, track chair and accessibility is Lori. And she'll be back here in the back. Um, we're looking for more volunteers to, to help with our track chair program. Um, PSAR, we talked about PSAR. That's in the orange tent out in front. And then Sleeping Bear Heritage Trail, Adopt the Beach are in the white tent back here. Okay, Clovers, Clover, Clover, uh, right back here in the back corner. Okay, very good. Yes. Oh, that is the uh, Preserve Historic Sleeping Bear, the other partner group for the park. Okay, and there's a bright cherry in the back. Our grass and dry cherry next to your like $30. 